Welcome everyone. On behalf of the Les Turner ALS Foundation, it is with pleasure to present our first ALS Learning Series program on ALS genetics featuring Lisa Kinsley. Lisa is a senior genetic counselor in the neurology department of Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Nicole Sammartino, and I'm the community education manager with the Les Turner ALS Foundation. Before we begin this presentation, I'd like to give a brief overview of the Les Turner ALS Foundation, and then I'll turn things over to Lisa for her presentation. It is with pride that I share with you that the Les Turner ALS Foundation is the leader in comprehensive ALS care in Chicagoland. We provide individualized care, local community support, and hope through scientific research. The Les Turner ALS Foundation is one of the longest serving independent ALS groups in the country. At the Lois and Salia ALS Clinic at the Les Turner ALS Center, we are proud to be one of Chicagoland's first and largest multidisciplinary ALS clinics with the highest number of neurologists and dedicated pulmonologists. The multidisciplinary care approach brings together an experienced team of neuromuscular specialists in one clinic to provide comprehensive support for people living with ALS. I like to think of the multidisciplinary approach as one-stop shopping. This means you'll be able to meet with each member of your care team at every single visit, minimizing the need for multiple doctor visits. Please note that due to COVID-19, our patients and families have the option of clinic visits virtually or in person. Our Les Turner ALS Center at Northwestern Medicine is led by the most well-respected and successful clinicians and researchers in the field, advancing vital care and research in pursuit of life-enhancing treatments and a cure. Our Les Turner ALS Center effectively connects the worlds of research and patient support to ensure the best care is provided and the brightest minds are working to find a cure. Today, Lisa will focus her presentation on covering genetics basics, as well as the inheritance patterns of both sporadic and familial ALS. She will review known familial ALS genes and the process for genetic testing for both symptomatic and pre-symptomatic individuals with familial ALS. She will also discuss the logistics of testing within a family, as well as the possible results of genetic testing and their implications. Lastly, Lisa will review the benefits genetic testing can have for clinical trial enrollment. Now I'm pleased to introduce Lisa Kinsley. Lisa is well known to many of our Les Turner ALS families through her work at our Lois and Salia ALS clinic. Lisa graduated with a biology degree from Valparaiso University, and then earned her master's degree from Northwestern University's Genetic Counseling Graduate Program in 2009, and then received board certification in 2010. Currently, she is a senior genetic counselor for Northwestern's neurology department. She provides genetic counseling services for patients with a variety of neurogenetic indications in the MDA, ALS, epilepsy, cognitive neurology, and movement disorders clinics. She also sees patients for a variety of genetic indications in Northwestern's Neurogenetic Counseling Clinic. Thanks, Nicole. I'm gonna turn off Thank my you, video Lisa. here. So I thought to start out the presentation, I'd go over a little bit about the basics of genetic counseling. So I don't get as many blank stares when I tell people what I do for a living as I used to, but there, there are a, a few mysteries left in what, what genetic counselors are and what we do that can help patients. So just generally speaking, genetic counselors are health professionals and we have specialized graduate degrees and experience in various areas of medical genetics and counseling. So a lot of genetic counselors work as members of healthcare teams and our role is to really provide information and support to families who have genetic disorders and their families who might be at risk for a wide variety of inherited genetic conditions. We also ask, act as resources for other healthcare professionals and also for the general public giving talks uh, like this one. Uh, and many genetic counselors are also involved in research activities and that's usually related to the field of medical genetics or genetic counseling. 
So genetic counseling is the process of helping people understand and adapt to a variety of implications that genetics can have on their lives. So there are medical implications, psychosocial implications, can affect the you know, uh, person's uh, family, their social standing, all these different things that come along with a genetic diagnosis. Um, and the, the process of genetic counseling integra integrates three things. So we have uh, interpretation of family and medical histories, and we use that to assess the, the risk or the chance of disease occurrence or reoccurrence. There's education about all different kinds of genetic aspects. So inheritance, testing, management, prevention, available resources, and research that people can get involved in. And then we also provide counseling to help people make the right choice for them, whether that's about testing or um, management options or just adapting to the risk or the condition that, that they or their family member have been diagnosed with. So as one of my roles, I am part of the multidisciplinary clinic at Northwestern. So at uh, at that clinic, I obviously provide genetic counseling for patients and families, and that can be a part of the clinic or it can be a separate appointment. But during those visits, we uh, take and assess a family history, possibly order genetic testing, or interpret genetic results if we've already ordered testing and are meeting to go over them, provide psychosocial counseling, and then as a, a kind of subset, we also do pre-symptomatic testing and counseling, so talking to people who are at risk for, for symptoms. So what is the role of genetic counseling in ALS? There are definite benefits for uh, sporadic ALS patients and familial ALS patients. So I just wanted to kind of go through uh, what those benefits are and, and what types of questions I tend to get from, from patients with, with both types of symptoms. So if we had just kind of 100 people here with um, a diagnosis of ALS, let's say we were able to interview all of them and get a little bit more information about their family history, since that is really what delineates the difference between sporadic ALS and familial ALS. So if we looked at, at everyone's family history in this group of 100 random people, with an ALS diagnosis, we'd find that about 90 of them, so 90% of ALS patients, will not have any relatives with any similar symptoms. So they won't have any family members with ALS, and they won't have any family members with anything else that we kind of think as being related to ALS. So what questions could we talk about or answer for people who have sporadic ALS? So, you know, we usually we still do go over that family history to determine that there isn't anything that, that makes us suspicious of familial symptoms, um, and then go over what kind of inheritance that would be, and then what that means for, for the patient and the family. So this is what a genetic pedigree looks like. Um, just to kind of orient you, the person that I'm talking to has the arrow pointed at them. They're what we call the proband. For genetic pedigrees, squares are males and circles are females. The different rows of symbols are different generations. So the uh, square with the arrow pointed at it, the circles and square next to him are his siblings, the one row above are parents, the row below are children and nieces and nephews. And if someone has a line drawn through them, that means that they have passed away. And if someone is colored in, that means that they have a symptom or a disorder or a diagnosis, something that we're tracking through the family to look to see if there are any patterns that make us suspicious of a genetic uh, etiology. So when we see a sporadic ALS family history, this is kind of what it usually looks like. You know, we don't see anyone else in the family who, who we would color in as blue. Usually there would be a lot more scribbling on the, on the pedigree with, you know, other people's ages and how they're doing, any other medical conditions, just to try to get a better understanding of, of who everyone is and how everyone is doing. So when we talk about inheritance of sporadic ALS, we use the term multifactorial inheritance. And you might have heard this before, it's, it's very similar to what we believe the inheritance is for things like heart disease or diabetes. And basically the thought is that everyone has a certain threshold for developing symptoms of these diagnoses, including SALS. So you can think of it like a jar. And there's risk factors that contribute to someone being able to reach that threshold for developing symptoms. So there's genetic factors, there are environmental factors, behavioral factors, lifestyle, and a lot of those things, we don't know exactly what they are yet. This is just the, the kind of 
current thought of, of how these things happen. So as we have our, our jar here, you know, throughout a person's life, you know, they're born with certain genetic factors that might predispose them to, to various conditions. And then throughout life, they, they continue to accumulate, you know, environmental factors or chemical exposures or lifestyle choices, different things that kind of add up over time. And if a person develops or accumulates enough of those factors, if they reach that threshold, the top of the jar in our example here, that puts them at risk for developing symptoms. So if someone accumulates enough of those factors, then they would be at risk. So if someone is born with more genetic factors, they're kind of, they kind of have a head start towards that threshold. It, it would take fewer environmental or those other kinds of factors to add up in this jar on the right versus the jar on the left where that person would have a lot more um, room to accumulate those things before they would be at risk for symptoms. So the unfortunate thing is we don't have a really good understanding of what those factors are, as I mentioned. So we don't have genetic testing for sporadic ALS in, in a lot of cases. Um, for most people who have sporadic ALS, we, we aren't able to identify a genetic cause, but there is research that's going on that is hoped to um, identify those genetic factors and environmental factors that, that may be able to um, help us get a better understanding of, of what those are and, and avoiding them in the future. So if we go back to our, our 100 patient, patients with ALS, we we focus first on the, the families without any related conditions, so no ALS, no, no other things that, that are neurological. But if we zoom in on the people who do have a family history, we'd find that about 10% of all ALS, ALS patients will have a relative with a similar or a related diagnosis. So if we go back to our pedigree, this might be what we see for a family with ALS. So same symbols as before, but here we see multiple people who have that, that blue shading indicating that they have, you know, let's say an ALS diagnosis. So this makes us much more suspicious that there is a, a directly heritable genetic cause. And what I'm seeing when I see this pedigree is what we call autosomal dominant inheritance. So dominant inheritance is the, the most common way that ALS is inherited. And what we look for for that would be that men and women are equally likely to, to be at risk for symptoms and that we would tend to see people who are affected in each generation. So you can see that the, the parent has symptoms, the, you know, the middle generation has people who are uh, diagnosed and the, the younger generation has people as well. So this is pretty straightforward. You know, this is for a long time, this is what we thought of as a family history of ALS. But as we've learned more and as we've learned of, of new genes, it, it actually can look a little bit more complicated. So you can see that, that the colors have changed a little bit and I've added a legend. So we see that, you know, we still have our, our proband who has the ALS diagnosis, but we have, you know, his sister, this circle to the right that's colored in purple. She may have, a, have had a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. We have a brother who has a uh, dementia diagnosis as well as his daughter. And the, the father had an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. So as we learn more about the genetics of ALS and the, the you know, other conditions that can be related genetically, we've had to expand our thinking about what a family history of ALS looks like, you know, what other things can be included that would qualify someone for genetic testing or make us uh, seriously consider um, a genetic factor that could play a role. So to talk a little bit more about autosomal dominant inheritance, this is uh, kind of a a focus on a particular gene and how it's inherited. So when we're talking about a condition with dominant inheritance, that means that uh, of a particular gene pair, one of those person's genes has a spelling change or what we call a pathogenic variant that causes it to not work properly and put that person at risk for symptoms. So let's say this is this is an ALS gene and we're looking at, at two people who, who are uh, looking at having children, one of them has an ALS variant, the other one does not. So when we're looking at what possible combinations of genes their children could, could inherit, we know that the green parent is always gonna pass on one of their working copies of this ALS gene, whereas the blue parent could either pass on the working copy of the ALS gene or the copy of the ALS gene that, that comes with a risk for symptoms. So 
that's where we get that 50-50 risk that we talk about when we talk about dominant conditions. Of the four possible combinations of that gene, half of them uh, result in a person who is not at risk and half of them result in a risk for an ALS diagnosis. So back to our, our group here. So if we had um, you know, funding to do testing on all of the, the familial ALS patients, we would be able to find a genetic cause in about 60% of them. So in order to talk a little bit more about genetic testing and the genes that we know about with ALS, I'm gonna back up, bring us back to, to high school biology for a little bit and talk about um, some genetics basics that can be helpful to, to have as background. So we talk about genetics, we're talking about genes and chromosomes, and these are present in every cell of our body. And our chromosomes are organized in pairs and we have uh, 23 pairs. We get one of each pair from each parent and the first 22 are the same for men and women, and the last pair of the sex chromosomes. Males typically have an X and a Y, and females typically have two Xs. So you can think of a chromosome kind of like a bookshelf, and the genes are the books on the shelf. So each chromosome has many, many genes on it, you know, hundreds and hundreds of genes on each chromosome. And unfortunately, it's not a very organized genetic library. All of the ALS genes, you know, aren't lined up next to each other. Um, neatly and you know we, we we don't have that kind of organizational system for for our chromosome but it does allow us to know you know as we identify genes to describe where they are and to be able to do testing for them so all of our genes are present in all of our cells but each cell type only uses the type of gene that they need to do their job so bone cells use bone genes brain cells use brain genes and these genes are active sometimes before we're born, as during development, some are active throughout our lives. They all have different roles that, that, um, that are important for, for normal functioning. So if we look closer at the language of our genes, it's this twisted ladder structure called DNA. And the DNA is essentially a recipe for a protein. So if we look at the full process, if we say that this little segment here is a gene, that would provide the instructions to string these amino acids together to make this protein. And proteins have all sorts of functions in the body, uh, some that we know, some that we don't know, you know, don't fully understand yet. But we do know that if there is a variant or a spelling change in a gene, that can lead to a change in the protein. And if the protein can't be made properly, then there can be issues um, you know, larger scale issues, uh, including symptoms like ALS. And we're just, we're, we're learning to, to understand those genetic variants better and how they uh, can lead to symptoms like ALS. So genes are inherited, as I mentioned, and because of that, that means that variants can be inherited as well. So like I said, we pass on half of our genetic information, either in egg or sperm cells. And if there's a variant in either of those um, cells DNA, then that is, um, you know, combines with, with the opposite cell to, to make, um, make the kind of initial cell we all start with that divides. And, and as that cell divides, it keeps copying that particular genetic variant. So that, that variant will be present in all of our cells and then that would put a person at risk for developing symptoms later in life. Another concept to consider when we're talking about genes and genetics is uh, what we call penetrance. So penetrance is a measurement of how likely it is that a person who has a particular genetic variant will go on to develop symptoms. So it's not necessarily 100%, and it's it's typically described by age. So usually um, you'd see something like a 50% chance by age 50 or an 80% chance by age 70. And that's really based on um, what we know about families and people who have that particular variant. So there are some variants that are more common than others. So if it's a very rare variant, if we don't have a lot of people who have been found to have that, we might not have enough data to have specific numbers like this. So it, it really depends on the gene and the variant to, you know, to wh whether we are able to provide this information to families. So if we look at what we know about uh, ALS genes, this is kind of a helpful little graph. So if we're looking at um, 
the number of genes that we know about as time goes on. So we start here with this um, circle labeled SOD1. So that was the first identified ALS gene, and that was in 1993. And then as time went on, you can see that, that we're, we're learning more and more about what genes are related to a person's risk for ALS. So there are I think the, the size of the circle here represents like how many people or what percentage of, of ALS uh, is encompassed by that gene. So you can see the next big breakthrough is this big circle here, the C9ORF72. But there's definitely a lot more genes that, that have been added and, and that we can look into uh, being a cause for someone's symptoms as time goes on. So it kind of, I think this, this graph ends in like 2016 or 2017. Um, but as time goes on, we, we have been able to identify more and more genes. Like I said, we're at about 60%, you know, finding causes for about 60% of people with, with familial ALS. And as time goes on, you know, we're just going to continue to learn more about what genes are out there. So looking at that a little bit different way, you can kind of break it down um, for, for sporadic ALS versus familial. So like we said, 90% of people with sporadic ALS um, have no family history, and about 11% of those people uh, will, will have a findable genetic cause, and that's versus familial ALS, so that's about 10% of ALS overall, and then the breakdown for what genes we know about for those individuals would be uh, about 45% of them would have a C9 variant, about 20% would have an SOD1 variant, Three, about 3% 3 would be those other more rare genes, those smaller circles on that last graph. And for about 33% of um, individuals with ALS or families with ALS, we aren't able to identify a genetic cause yet because like I said, we just haven't identified what all of our genes do. So we haven't been able to find all of the genes that cause ALS for people. So a little bit more specifics about the C9ORF72 gene. This gene is a little bit unique. It's what we call a repeat expansion. And it does account for 45% of familial ALS and seven to 10% of sporadic ALS. So this is a gene that was identified in 2011 and it was identified in families with both ALS and FTD. So if you look at this diagram here, you can see these, these line with the boxes on it. Genes get um, translated a little bit when they get um, you know, copied over to make instructions to make proteins. So the, the boxes are kind of like the important chapters of information about how to make this particular protein. And you can say, see that between the first and the second um, you know, chapter or exon, we call them, there's this repeated area. So this repeated area is um, nuclear base pairs and it is a six uh, letter block that's repeated over and over again. So it's four G's and then two C's repeated over and over again. And that is a normal part of the gene that is supposed to be there. The problems occur when that repeated section gets too big. So if someone has more than 30 repeats of that six letter block, that makes it, makes it hard for that cell to be, or for that gene to be translated into the protein. So there are still some mysteries with um, C9. You know, we're still learning exactly what, what the proteins do and how that functions. But we do know, we have seen that it, it does exhibit incomplete penetrance. So um, for, for people who are um, at about 58, we tend to see about half of them would have uh, symptoms from the C9 gene. And that does increase to nearly 100% by, by 80 years of age. So typically we would start with genetic testing for this gene just because it is the most common cause for people. The next most common gene is SOD1. So this is that one that kind of started things off in 1993. This one is the cause for about 20% of families with familial ALS. Um, the penetrance of this gene is about 50% by age 46. And then it, it rises to about 90% of people um, with SOD1 variants are symptomatic by age 70. And this is another gene that exhibits autosomal dominant inheritance. And most of the variants in the SOD1 gene are a letter change. So you can see on this original sequence, the, um, let's see, the fifth letter here is a, a red T, you know, so it's, it's looking for that. If there is a, what we call a point mutation or a variant that changes that letter, 
you can see that there's a C there now. So that, that could change the translation of that gene into a protein. And if it affects how that protein is able to function, that can lead to a, a person being at higher risk for symptoms. So um, now that we, we are all genetics experts, we could talk a little bit more detail about what does genetic testing mean? So when we talk about genetic testing, we have a couple different options. And usually we start off, um, like I said, with that C9 gene. So this could just be you know, starting with C9 because it's more common and then moving on to a panel. And sometimes it depends on, on family history. So whether or not we see dementia, if someone has a particularly fast or slow course for symptoms, that might make us more suspicious of one gene over another. But typically we, we start with C9 um, to get the repeat expansion count and then move on to panel testing. So panel test is just a group of genes and they kind of range from, uh, they range depending on the lab that they're ordered from, but anywhere from 11 to 46 genes. Sometimes dementia genes are kind of included in with the ALS genes, and it's just a way to sequence all of those genes at once and get, get information about however many genes are included to get a full picture of uh, whether or not we're able to find a genetic cause for that particular individual. This uh, genetic testing may or may not be covered by insurance. It really depends on a person's policy and um, you know, possibly some of the workup that they've had done or um, their, their diagnosis at a given point in time. So that is one of the roles that I play is helping people determine what their out-of-pocket cost is going to be for genetic testing. Um, there are free testing programs that exist for patients with a family history so that sometimes is an option for people. Um, usually when I talk to people about costs for genetic testing, it tends they tend to, to um, be surprised when I talk about how much it costs. I think um, it, the cost has come down a lot recently and I think we can usually do um, we can usually do genetic testing for people for about five, six hundred dollars if they're really wanting it and insurance isn't going to pay for it, that would be the out-of-pocket cost that we would be looking at. So what are what are some of the reasons to actually pursue genetic testing? So there are a lot of benefits, but there's also limitations. So some of the benefits include providing a sense of relief from uncertainty. You know, this is a hard diagnosis to get or a hard diagnosis to have in your family. And it can be helpful to have um, you know, a, a reason, you know, it's, it's, it can be kind of a relief to have that. And that can also help people make decisions about all kinds of things from healthcare to finances to, you know, what kind of house to buy or careers, different things that can be impacted by this information. Uh, it may also be able to provide prognosis information. It's not a crystal ball. It's not going to give us an exact you know, course for the future, but we can sometimes look at other people who have similar genetic causes to be able to, to um, give at least some information. Um, it may also be a enrollment criteria for clinical trial participation, which is something I'll touch on a little bit later. It can help people make decisions about whether or not to have children or how to have children. There are ways to reduce the risk of passing on a genetic variant that can cause ALS. So that might be something that, that people want to take advantage of if they know that they themselves have that same gene or are at risk. And it can also clarify risks to family members. So that's usually a big part of the discussion is you know, the risks to children or siblings or parents that, that we um, can, can go over in a little bit more detail when we have a genetic cause. So those are all good reasons to get genetic testing. Some of the limitations that I usually talk about with people would be um, some of the consequences of the results. You know, it can be a very emotional process. Um, it can be hard socially. You know, it can be hard financially. People um, react differently to that information. So it's, it's important to, to take that into consideration when you're deciding whether or not genetic testing might be right for you. Uh, genetic testing you know, it's, it's a good thing, you know, it can give us information for family members, but it can also make, make for some tense family situations. So that's something that I also explore with people about, you know, how their family members, um, you know, who they've talked to, who knows about this, if there's, you know, people who are, um, you have strong feelings one way or the other, that's helpful information to help people navigate that. Um, there's also uh, concerns for genetic discrimination. Usually people um, have questions about what does having a positive genetic test mean for you know, healthcare or employment, 
and we do have protections in place. There's a federal law called GINA that is uh, protection for health insurance and employment. So they can't deny a promotion or fire someone or deny um, you know, health insurance based on a genetic result. But these things, that, that, that federal protection does not apply to things like, like life insurance or long-term care, or some of these other policies that people may want. So kind of timing those things is, can be helpful for, for making sure we don't have to deal with, um, you know, some of that, um, some problematic, you know, things that can get in the way of getting those types of policies. And like I said, it's not a crystal ball, so it's not going to give us exact information. It, it, it gives us some information, but not everything. Um, a frustrating thing about genetic testing for neurological conditions is that for most of them, we don't have a treatment for or a way to, to prevent symptoms from happening, um, which, is, which is a frustration and, and honestly a reason that a lot of people choose not to get testing. Uh, another thing about it is that it can be costly. So, you know, it's, it's something that, um, like I said, insurance may not cover and, and people may not have the resources to pay for the genetic testing. So um, hopefully that's less of an issue with insurance coverage and some of the free programs that are out there, but there are you know, costs that come along with it. So whenever we do a genetic test, there's three different types of results that we can get. So we can get a positive result, and a positive result would mean that we find a pathogenic variant or variants in a gene. And depending on why we ordered the test, this could confirm someone's diagnosis. This could identify an increased risk of developing a disease in the future. Um, and if we do have that positive result, we could start to talk about family planning or clinical trials. Some of these things become options at that point. We could also get a negative result. So that would mean that the laboratory didn't find any variants in any of the genes that that particular test was, was looking at. So that could mean that, that the person doesn't have an increased risk of developing a disease. But if we are testing someone who has an ALS diagnosis, it's not gonna change that diagnosis, unfortunately. Like we, we've kind of gone over, most people who have an ALS diagnosis won't have a positive genetic test. Um, but it's, it's just one of the tools that we use to try to learn more about why a person may be having these symptoms. Um, another possibility for a negative test result is that, you know, there could be a genetic cause out there. It could just be a genetic cause that we haven't identified yet. So maybe there is a gene that, that we just don't know about that's causing a family's symptoms. Um, any test that, that we have at this point may not show that if we don't know that that gene is related to ALS. So those are kind of the two straightforward uh, answers from a genetic test, um, but we can also get what we call a variant of uncertain significance or a VUS. So everyone has a lot of different DNA variants that, that don't affect their health. They just have different versions of genes that, um, that make everyone unique. And if someone has a genetic test that finds a new a you know, new spelling of a particular ALS gene, it can be really difficult to determine the effect that that might have on a person on, on that gene. You know, does that affect the protein or how that gene is, is um, used by the cell? We may not always know, especially if it's the first time that we've seen it. So there are different things that the lab does. They kind of analyze where uh, in the gene that variant is. Is it a really important spot? Is it a big change? You know, is it a very different amino acid that gets coded for? They also model it on the computer to see what the predicted protein structure is like. You know, is it, is it have a big, big effect on the protein structure or is it in a, an area that has kind of some wiggle room to, to have some differences? Sometimes we, we can kind of lean one way or the other, but a lot of times it does come down right in the middle and we end up just with a, an uncertain result that we can check in with um, the lab as time goes on. Another difference in, in types of genetic testing would be diagnostic versus pre-symptomatic. So diagnostic testing is, is what I've mainly been talking about so far. So this is, um, you know, for individuals who have a diagnosis, we're looking to see if we can find a genetic cause for their symptoms. So in that respect, it's fairly straightforward. Obviously, this can um, have psychosocial implications. That can be hard information to, to get, and people um, may need help dealing with, with that, um, that type of genetic diagnosis. Um, the other type of testing that we um, deal with for, for ALS is pre-symptomatic testing. So these are 
this is uh, testing for people who are at risk for ALS. We know that there is a, um, a family history. Uh, we would need to have a family gene that is known. So we would need someone in the family who has symptoms, who has pursued testing to have, let's say, a positive C9 test or a positive SOD1 test. So we need to say, yes, we know what the gene in the family is that is causing these symptoms. At that point, we'd be able to test other unaffected family members to see if they inherited that or not. So this type of testing has a lot of psychosocial implications. It's a big decision to decide if you want this or not. Um, there's a testing protocol that usually involves meeting with a genetic counselor, sometimes a neurologist. Uh, it kind of varies from center to center. Um, but you know, it's it's a big decision to get this, and part of that is that we really can't prevent or predict uh, the onset of symptoms. Uh, or the age of onset or the progression for a lot of these things. So it gives us some information about a person's risk for developing symptoms, but not a lot of specifics about what to expect and when. So other factors to consider, you know, if there's psychological manifestations from the gene, um, you know, what to expect there. There may be incomplete penetrance and, and just the fact that there may not be preventative treatment and, and for ALS there is not at this time. So the pre-symptomatic discussion is um, just that, a, a long discussion about what a person's understanding is of the disease in their family, what they, what they perceive their risk, you know, if they have, um, you know, really trying to walk people down the road of, you know, what, um, what would a negative result change for you? What would a positive result change for you in all different kinds of areas of their life? So relationships, children, savings, travel, career path, lots of different ways that, that this might affect people's decisions. Uh, another thing that we talk about is the timing of the testing. Why are they interested in testing at this point in time? You know, is this a particularly stressful time? Um, is there, was there a divorce or a marriage or holidays? You know, there could be different things that that compound that stress that it may not be the best time for them to pursue the testing. Um, also looking at their social support system. So who they're gonna tell about the results, when they're gonna tell them about the results, if the people in their life are supportive about their decision to be testing, um, all different things like that, just to, to kind of prepare them um, for, for families' reactions and, and help them come up with a game plan for you know who they're going to tell and when um, and also making sure that they have their questions answered about insurance or employment discrimination and that they have you know life insurance disability financial plans that, that those are as in place as people want them before they pursue testing like this so really for pre-symptomatic testing the goal is to get a true negative result for that patient um, we want to be able to give them uh, a yes or no for whether or not they inherited that variant that we that we know to be in their family. So I have some kind of scenarios to walk through here. So we're back to our family here, but this time we're we're looking at this um, this uh, man in the lower left with the arrow pointed at him. So let's say we have a family history of ALS here. His dad has ALS, and um, he wants to know. The son wants to know: Is he at risk for developing that that disease as well? So in this case, you can see dad is alive, so we do have the option of doing genetic testing for him. So let's say we order a panel for dad and we find out that dad has an SOD1 variant. He's positive for SOD1. So if that is the case, we can test you know, any of, any of these family members really, but the son who's interested, he can be tested for that specific spot in the SOD1 gene that has a variant and we can get him a yes or no answer about whether or not he inherited that. And that would be associated with that 50-50 risk because either dad is gonna pass on the working copy of SOD1 or he's gonna pass on the copy of SOD1 that has that genetic variant. So let's say we order a panel on dad and we don't find any genetic variants. We look at all the genes that we know about to be related to ALS and we don't find anything. Everything looks normal. I mean, looking at the family history, we can say that there, there, there is a genetic cause. You know, we, we have more than one family member affected. There's probably, there is something genetic out there. It's just not something that we know about at this point in time. So because we don't know the genetic cause of the ALS in this family, it wouldn't be helpful to test the son. You know, we, we couldn't order that panel on him because it wouldn't give us any new information. We wouldn't be testing for the true cause of ALS in that family because we don't know it at this point. So let's say 
that that this uh, individual comes to talk to me and all the people in his family who have ALS have passed away, which is a, a, a scenario that we deal with. So let's say this individual wants to get genetic testing for his risk for ALS, but we maybe we don't, you know, no one in the family had genetic testing. So that really limits the options for, for this individual and let me explain why. So let's say um, this person wants, wants to know their risk, so we order testing for SOD1 and C9 or F72. You know, those, those are the two most common. Let's, let's check those genes to see if we can find a genetic variant. So if the son tests positive for an SOD1 variant, then we kind of have our answer. So we know that, that the dad would have had an SOD1 variant, each of the affected family members would have had it as well. So it, it kind of gives us an, that answer for the family that, that SOD1 is the cause for their, their symptoms and the son did inherit that SOD1 variant. It's a little bit more likely that we would get negative testing for SOD1 and C9, just because overall, most people with with ALS don't have a genetic cause. So let's say, you know, we, we test this man, he has negative testing for those two genes. And, you know, we don't know it, or we didn't know it from this, but let's say the dad did have an SOD1 variant. That's good news, right? So that the dad had the SOD1 variant and the son did not inherit that. So he has at, you know, baseline general population risk for developing symptoms. But the other scenario is that we do the testing for the son, he tests negative for SOD1 and C9, and it doesn't give us an accurate picture of the family. So let's say that, you know, if we had tested the dad, you know, let's say that there is a genetic cause for, for his ALS and the family member's ALS, but it's some new gene that hasn't been identified yet. So testing the son for SOD1 and C9 or F72 really doesn't tell us very much about his risk for developing symptoms. He's still at a 50-50 risk for inheriting, you know, the, the copy of this new gene, but because we don't know about it yet, it's not something that we can offer testing for. So this seems reassuring, you know, it's good news that those are negative, but it's not really testing the cause in the family. So even if we were, you say, all right, well, let's just order all of the ALS genes, we'll check everything. Because we don't know all of the ALS genes, that is, it's a tricky, tricky proposition. So it doesn't give us a full picture of, of you know, every possible ALS gene. So it's, it's, it's still able to miss, you know, that genetic cause. So it's, it's a complicated situation to talk through and, and definitely frustrating for, for us and for patients. Um, but that's why it's important to take that family history into context and have an understanding of, you know, do we know the genetic cause in the family and, and what's the appropriate thing to test? And sometimes we, we just can't offer testing if we don't know the genetic cause because we aren't able to interpret what, what a result would mean for, for that individual in that family. So in conclusion, I know that was a lot about different testing scenarios, but the, the bottom line is that we do need a positive test result in order to offer testing to unaffected family members. And the reason for that is just because not everyone with familial ALS will have a findable genetic variant. So if you only test an asymptomatic person, we're not gonna get a, a full picture of, of what the cause is for that, that person and that family. We really wanna get that true negative test result. So I know we talked a little bit about clinical trials earlier. So um, there are uh, clinical trials for familial ALS that are targeting specific genes. And for um, eligibility criteria, obviously you would have to have a positive genetic test because you want to prove that you have the genetic cause that their genetic or that their um, clinical trial is targeting. And there's a wide variety of strategies for these clinical trials. You know, it could be that they want to silence the gene so that abnormal protein isn't made, or it could be that we want to stop that abnormal protein from causing damage or building up over time. There's different mechanisms that are at work for um, different genes and different variants. So, so it does um, it does vary depending on the the gene and the drug. Um, but I would say a great way to to keep up on what is out there is by either talking to your neurologist or keeping up with uh, Les Turner or looking at clinicaltrials.gov. That's a search engine for clinical trials, so you can kind of keep an eye on. Um, what is going on out there, if they're recruiting, um, 
it's a little it's a little uh, you have to get the hang of it but you can search by gene or diagnosis or location there's lots of different ways to see what is going on um, in the in the world of research for for genetic and non-genetic ALS so in conclusion, um, genetic counseling can be helpful for all ALS patients and family members. There's um, a lot of questions that come along with an ALS diagnosis for, for everyone involved. So a genetic counselor can be a helpful member of the team um, to, to hopefully get some answers to uh, you know, risks for family members and, and you know, uh, what the likelihood is being able to find an answer for why this is happening. Um, Genetic counselors are, are helpful for discussing options for diagnostic and pre-symptomatic testing, also going up over options for family planning and, and research participation. Um, if you are local, I'm more than happy to meet with you. Um, but if you are not local, there's also um, other genetic counselors who specialize in ALS or neurogenetics. So you can find a genetic counselor in your area at www.nsgc.org. They have a genetic counselor finder tool that's pretty helpful. So I think with that, I would be happy to answer any questions that uh, have come in from our participants. Lisa, thank you. That was such an informative presentation, and I'm sure you equipped our viewers with a lot of knowledge today. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. now I'd like to get to some to get to some answers to questions that we received in advance. And Lisa, our first question is: ALS runs in my family as a C9ORF72 mutation. Two uncles and a cousin died from ALS. How close are we to a cure or long-term treatment? And am I and my siblings at an increased risk for inheriting ALS? Yeah, so so that's a good question. I'm I'm very sorry to hear about about your family members. Um, I wish I had a good answer for you about you know when we will have a cure. Unfortunately, I don't think anyone knows that. Uh, I can say that we have come a very long way in the last few years, and we're definitely closer than ever before to having a treatment or a cure for ALS. Um, you know, it's 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 not something. Another thing, I don't have a crystal ball for, unfortunately. Uh, but in terms of genetic risk, I can say that you would, um, you may be at risk for for also having that C9 um, variant or expansion. I think it would be very helpful to meet with a genetic counselor to go over your specific family history to 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 refine that risk and get a more personalized um, discussion about. Um, what your risk is and, and whether testing could be helpful for you. Thank you, Lisa. Our next question is, if someone has the mutation, what determines if a person will get the disease? Yeah, another good question. So we know that if someone has like one of those single gene genetic causes that, that we've been talking about through this lecture, that comes with a very high risk to de develop ALS. But we know that even if people in the same family, they have the same genetic variant, not everyone will develop the same symptoms at the same time or, or even at all. So there's probably other genetic factors that play into this. Um, there are probably protective factors that, that maybe um, cause someone to, to, to live longer without developing symptoms. There may be lifestyle factors that, that play into that. Like I said before, there's a lot of research going into that to try to determine what modifies those risks. Um, we don't have a really good answer for what they are yet. We're still working on that, but, but you're right. There is some variability. And like I said, not everyone will develop symptoms. So, so we're still trying to understand why that is. Great, thank you. The next question, Lisa, is, is Lewy body disease related to ALS? So Lewy body disease has its own genes that have been found to cause it. And it's, it's not unheard of for uh, families to have two, you know, unrelated neurologic diagnoses. Um, but one of the questions that I would have if I was taking a family history is, um, you know, whether or not this was diagnosed based on someone's symptoms or at an autopsy, we can get a lot more information if we look at, you know, brain tissue, for example, and we can get a more specific diagnosis. Um, you know, if, if we have a, a more specific answer for, for what a diagnosis is, you know, is it Lewy body disease or, or 
or could it fit under the umbrella of dementia? And maybe that would be related to say a C9 expansion. So I think that is uh, another thing that I ask when taking family histories, you know, what, how do we know this diagnosis? What, what, um, what testing or what um, evaluations were done to try to learn more about it, just to see, um, you know, how, how sure we are about that diagnosis, whether that's someone who passed away and, and didn't have an autopsy or, you know, a great, great grandparent that, that had, uh, you know, some kind of paralysis that didn't have a real name, you know, decades and decades ago. That's a lot of the, the kind of teasing out of, of um, symptoms and family history that we do. So I think that is, um, need a little bit more information, but I think if it's, it's something that, that we, could, we could talk more about, you know, whether or not it might be related, depending on what we know about that person's diagnosis. That's helpful. And our last question is, um, how should I know if I should get genetic testing and where do I start? Sure. So I would say if you have um, symptoms and you want more information, uh, whether that's for you or your family or to, to get involved in research, I think that is um, a fine reason to get genetic testing. Um, if you're you know, in that kind of symptomatic category, it's definitely an individual decision and, and you know, it's, it's up to a person if they want that information. So um, I would say the first step would be talking to a neurologist or meeting with a genetic counselor to go over the family history in more detail, um, just to get some personalized recommendations about what testing might be helpful um, and what the likelihood of, of being able to find a genetic variant might be. Um, on the other hand, if you're in the situation where you have a parent or a family member who has a genetic form of ALS, um, that's, a, that's a, a different kind of decision to make. So it's something that, um, you know, you may want to know for family planning reasons, you may want to know for financial planning, um, or even to get involved in research. So it's something that um, you should uh, definitely meet with a genetic counselor to talk about those kinds of things, just to be prepared for, for what the testing entails. And, um, you know, what, what that information can and can't tell you. So it's, it's an individual decision. You know, there's no right answer for everyone, but I would say um, even if you're just curious, if you're wanting to know what your risk is and what the chances of finding something are, um, you can always meet with a genetic counselor. It's not a, you know, a foregone conclusion that they're gonna end up get a, getting genetic testing. You know, it can just be a discussion and, and there are some people who talk to me and decide, you know what, I am not interested in genetic testing. You know, it's, it's not for me, but, but I'm there to be an unbiased source of information and, um, ha, you know, ha, give people the chance to ask their questions and, and get that uh, information that they need to make whatever decision is right for them. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like some great places to start there and great suggestions. Lisa, thank you. And I'd like to thank all who participated in today's webinar. Please stay in touch with us. Uh, you can connect with us in a variety of ways listed on the slide. Be on the lookout for our next webinar, and we look forward to connecting again soon. Thank you.